Nick, an international executive communications consultant with 30 years of experience, has served top-level executives from companies like ABN, Amro, Avaya, BMW, Microsoft, and Zurich. His expertise in executive coaching and efficiency analysis is complemented by his commitment to corporate social responsibility, particularly ISO 26000. A passionate advocate for the ocean, Nick is a member of the United Nations Ocean Decade and has dedicated his efforts to combat plastic pollution, notably through his initiative, The Plastic Plug. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to uh, really say a big thanks to the Thrive team for inviting me here. Morris, thank you so much for this opportunity. And also thanks to Felix and especially Madhukar. You have been really talking so much about uh, the um, topic of water that uh, you take a lot of uh, my stuff already ahead. Uh, you introduced me very nicely about my professional career, Not let's not go into this anymore, but I want to tell you a little bit about my private life. I spent the last 10 years in the Philippines, I dedicated a sabbatical, which I extended to seven years, to plastic pollution. Uh, as mentioned before, we proposed a solution, we made our way all the way up to the office of the president, but then uh, the pandemic came and uh, everything came to a halt. I do not hold an academic degree. I also financed all my operations on my own and just with my own savings and uh, money from family and friends. I do not take any donations or membership fees, uh, which I think makes me a little bit an independent voice in this topic. My main driver was the pain that I felt about uh, the topic of uh, how we get to the next generation a planet which is really pretty much messed up. So we hope that we can give the new generations tools and skills in order to tackle the problems they have. Today we talk about the role of ocean literacy and ocean empathy in marine litter. I will just say quickly a little bit about marine litter. It's a topic everybody has seen in the news all over again, so I won't take a lot of time on that. And uh, I want to introduce to you the ocean literacy and the ocean decade. Before, I have a very personal call for ocean empathy. So the definition of marine litter is pretty clear. The definition of marine litter is only solid material, so sewages and oil and chemicals would not be part of that. Um, and uh, of course, it's all about what human people are littering. So I think the English word says it very well. I think most of you know about uh, the whole situation of plastics, uh, the main pollution uh, we are looking at in marine litter in the ocean. Uh, you all heard about uh, the fact that uh, plastic is breaking apart into microplastics. You you heard about fishing gears, uh, the so-called ghost nets might be a word you have been uh, confronted with. Uh, you know about the patches of litter in certain ocean currents. Uh, we have huge garbage patches which are apparently as big as uh, a continent can be. And uh, all of this should be knowledge for you. What you might not know is that 80% of the trash is entering the ocean through rivers and that the Philippines is actually the most emitting or let's say polluting uh, country in the world. Even um, older studies which have been retracted, uh, newer studies show the same data. It's really an extraordinary high amount of pollution happening here, which makes the Philippines a global issue because we have only one ocean. And then some of the plastics break down into microplastics and they are then uh, the ones who uh, are really being dispersed all along our big ocean. The following pictures are also probably something you have seen already, so I will just put them in as a reminder. Sea turtles mistaking jellyfish as their food, whales found full of uh, plastic in their stomachs. Very painful for me is here uh, the, the birds, a mother bird flying 300 kilometers to bring food for their little chicks, and then both of them die of hunger because uh, their bellies are full with plastic. And uh, you have probably all seen the horrible effects of uh, uh, fishing gears. Um, in the old times, that material was natural, so fish could uh, and animals could bite their way out of it. They can't do it anymore nowadays with the plastic. And uh, very famous peanut, the turtle with the six pack around its um, tape. When we look at education, at ocean literacy, I, I'm pointing to a place in time uh, which is even before my birth. In 1961, the United States National Science Education Standards were established. And guess what? Uh, nobody really put the ocean in there. There was very little knowledge about the ocean. And shockingly for me, it took another 40 years before we started to create essential principles and fundamental concepts about ocean literacy.
Now, globally, ocean literacy has its place. Uh, the simplest uh, definition comes from UNESCO, understanding our influence on the ocean and the ocean's influence on us. And the uh, really interesting point I found is here, uh, the sentence where it says, and the ability to make informed decisions. So ocean literacy is about having enough information that your decisions are based on a real scientific uh, basic. There is a fantastic toolkit here, uh, the Ocean Literacy Toolkit. You can find it on the UNESCO page, and it really is a, a great help. And uh, the portal of, uh, the of the United Nation Ocean Decade, which I'm going to introduce to you, is really a wonderful and probably the best project I have seen in humanity in a long time. Started in 2021, the United Nations Decade aims for 10 years with 10 challenges for one ocean. And the vision is to create the science we need for the ocean we want. We are calling about science and scientific uh, um, uh, research, but we also really look for connecting people with the ocean. That is really what even this webinar here is about for me today. I want to connect you with the ocean. There are seven ocean decade out comes. I don't have the time to go through all of them, but you're going to see that it's uh, not surprising that the first one is already about the clean ocean as a pollution is a top um, uh, topic, of course, here. This one I want to point out because it's really showing very clear how we need to first understand before we can start to protect. <clears throat> and we have to protect before we can start to restore. And all of this has to be really professionally managed which is what the ocean decade is about. Uh, then we have productive ocean, we have an predicted ocean, we talk about hazards, a safe ocean. And one thing I want to point out, that's the accessible ocean. And I saw in my work with the ocean decade teams, an amazing project about the Mediterranean Sea where scientists came together and created a digital twin, a simulation which in real time can show you, for example, if a ship wrecks and the oil is spilling out, then it can show you in real time where will the oil spill go exactly that's a really wonderful example for modern data information technology and the power of innovation what humans can achieve when they put their forces together and last not least tourism uh, of course it's about human well-being the ocean is inspiring and engaging the literature portal is a one-stop shop for everything you need, and it doesn't matter where you come from, but uh, the uh, Ocean Decades uh, Ocean Literacy Portal is multi-language, and it has everything from training courses to events to teacher materials. Even you can meet an expert there personally and talk to them. For everyone, there are training materials, resources and informations. And for every interested citizen, and this is what I call you out to, is to take action towards an ocean literate society. This is what we need, an ocean literate society. There are seven ocean literacy principles. The Earth has one big ocean with many features. The ocean and life in the ocean shape the features of Earth. We heard from uh, Matuka before already how much influence on weather and climate is there. We learned already things like how whales are creating oxygen, how plankton is intertwined with weather and climate. Uh, we learned uh, about the SML, a very thin layer on top of the ocean, uh, which interacts with the atmosphere. And the destruction of this layer of this SML could lead to a toxic atmosphere and kill all life on the planet much faster than any climate heat wave could do. So many things to be learned. The ocean made the Earth habitable. Many people think that here in the Philippines, actually life started in the ocean and the ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. When you think of coral reefs in the tropics and the krill and plankton in the Arctic uh, sea, you can see that's really very diverse. Last not least, the ocean and humans are inextricably interconnected. We lost this connection over the last centuries and we really have to work on them. And uh, it's really important that we learn that we are connected and that we learn that we don't know anything about the ocean. There is so little knowledge, there's so much which has to be explored. Ocean literacy is a very important factor in all of this. Why is ocean literacy so important? Why is it so important for me? 
In my work with the ocean plastic pollution, I have been seeing so many misconceptions and wrong narrations and narratives, and those wrong narratives are really problematic. Uh, Coca-Cola chokes the ocean. We need better laws. People are not educated. We need more bins. Waste colonialism is the reason for the Philippines polluting. We need glass bottles. All those narratives are around there. And in those seven years of uh, work, I have been really trying to understand all of this and um, surprisingly, uh, there was a lot of those narratives turned out to be wrong. I don't have the time to go through all of them, but I want to show one story and share it with you today. And that is what I call the Coca-Cola witch hunt. Right now we have the idea Coca-Cola chokes the ocean. Some of you might know the story of Jon Snow. Uh, if not, you can read it in a fantastic article of the Journal of Ethics. In the 1850s in London, cholera broke out and uh, it killed all uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, Jon Snow was uh, actually not like me, non-academic. He was even a surgeon, but he didn't belong to the academic elite. And the academic elite had the theory of miasma. It was bad air, which was creating uh, cholera and transporting cholera. So uh, the, they blamed the cholera on the slums of London and they even asked that the smell is disease and it's important to air out the slums. So by thinking that cholera was transported through the air, all the focus was in the mitigation on uh, ventilation and stuff like that. And that's a fantastic example of how a wrong uh, uh, assumption, a wrong narrative can lead to completely wrong mitigation systems. So what Jon Snow did was he did one of the first data maps. He created a map where he went from door to door, knocked on the doors and said, hey, how many people died here and put it into a map. And he got a dot map and he saw clusterings and he saw the clusterings around this famous water pump. And he famously went there and removed the lever of the water pump. And cholera ended and so many people were uh, protected uh, and uh, did not die anymore. Another famous map is the one that uh, made Abraham Lincoln to uh, change his mind about slavery and uh, to end slavery. So a wrong narrative leads to wrong mitigations. Let's do the same thing. And I did that with my volunteers, partly students, 17, 18 years old. It's very easy, actually. Just have a look at the pollution map. And if you claim that Coca-Cola is the reason for the ocean pollution, then there should be a clear scientific proven correlation between the amount of Coca-Cola being consumed, the bottles being out there, and the uh, pollution. So here is a 2018 data of uh, uh, Coca-Cola. They didn't want to give me their data. They are not really easy to come by. This is 2018. You can see North America here in dark blue uh, with 19%, uh, Asia Pacific with 25%. So a slightly smaller shape of this pizza uh, pizza uh, uh, piece here uh, a little bit smaller than in asia pacific now let's look at our pollution map and let's look at new york the city of cities and we can see the pollution in the different rivers here 14,000, 15,000 kilogram long beach uh, these are the numbers uh, according to uh, the most modern mathematical uh, and statistical models for ocean pollution and there is one top spot it's this little red dot and it's in the Delaware Bay and it says 126,000 kilogram. And now let's look over to Asia Pacific and let's see what's going on here in the Philippines. And that's a completely different picture. 12 million in Kuala Lumpur, 62 million kilogram in the Pasig River here in the Philippines where I live. And when we look at Europe, we can see the same picture. Even big cities, London, Rotterdam, Hamburg, they are not as big as Manila, but still the pollution numbers are completely somewhere else and they do not correlate at all with the numbers of coca-cola consumption uh, just yesterday before this webinar i got the newest data from 2024 you can see america north america united states with 39,300 million uh, liters of coca-cola compared to the philippines with 2,800 million liters of coca-cola and just compare the pollution rate so uh, this is a typical example for wrong narratives uh, leading to wrong 
mitigations. So my call to you is inform yourself and don't even use my links. Uh, don't do it. Go out there and make your own informed decision. Literacy means informed opinions and they create informed decisions or give you the power for informed decisions. I don't have the time to go through all of them, but uh, uh, the EPR narrative is, of course, that it's all the producers' responsibility. Uh, that's not true, as we know. Uh, th that's the real SDG over there. Consumption plays a role. Uh, we believe that it has a lot to do with the habit and the people. It's a mix of management and habit. And after all, the first rule of a market, a free markets uh, economy is that the consume drives the production, not the other way around. So what I call out is what I call a human respect crisis. And we saw it before. Uh, Felix spoke about uh, deforestations, about uh, the fragmentation of habitats. It's not just in the plastic pollution topic. When we look at biodiversity, wildlife extinctions, when we look at the way how we are handling nature, that is really something which is very, very painful. And it is not only in Southeast Asia. I was recently in Europe and I did my same research there and I find more and more signs that this is on the rise, even in European countries. Um, I found something in Madhuka's uh, TED call where he compares Western science with Vedic science and he claims that it's in Vedic science worshipping nature to grow in harmony. And that brings me to my last topic, my call for ocean empathy. And for this I have two pictures and small little videos for you. I still hope I have the time to show them quickly. Uh, the first picture here you can see children reacting to something. And uh, this little girl over here, she is shocked. It's a very young girl she has an instinctively shocked and painful reaction to what's happened her mother is uh, obviously not comfortable herself i'm going to show you the video in a moment and uh, she is uh, not comfortable but she has to be there it's a traditional event and the other mother with the boy with the blue hat here uh, he is, she is really excited and she brings all that excitement to the young boy and what are they looking at let's have a look at what they are looking at they are looking at a whale Hunt. And I put this into slow motion for you so that you can see it. I, I didn't show the real actual killing of the whales, but you see that uh, they are wading here in, in blood red water and then you see in a very short scene you can see uh, how the kids reacting to it look how shocked that little girl is and how excited that young boy next to her is how the mother reacts uh, taking the hand of the little girl trying to calm her down while the other one is really explaining and making it more impressive to what's happening there so our question in empathy is, how do we want to let our children grow up? Should they have a natural empathy for those animals who are slaughtered away? Or should we create killers? And it's a fascinating thing. What you just saw is the uh, Grind, that's uh, the uh, northern Faroe Islands uh, regular hunt for whales, where around a thousand citizens come to death every year. And the question is really, what do we teach our children? And the next and last example and last slide on my presentation is about uh, the opposite. It's really harmony with nature. And this is my personal hero. I have to cry whenever I talk about her. And I'm going to show her just what she's doing. And I, I want you to just uh, really feel what's going on here. So the narrative again is that sharks are brutal killers. They are monsters. They have no feelings. And what is happening here? Oh my God, what is happening? This woman removes actually hooks from the mouth, fisher hooks from the mouth of a shark. And the sharks are floating to her. She removed one hook from a shark and the next day she dove. Many sharks came to her. So sharks are not stupid killer machines. They are really full of feelings, emotion and very smart. They are 450 million years on the planet and they somehow communicated to each other. You can trust this woman. You can trust her so much that you can even let her reach into your mouth and take hooks out. In 26 years, Christina Zenato has removed over 380 hooks from uh, sharks and sharks are petting with her and sharks are lying calmly in her lap. And that is what I call ocean empathy, empathy, harmony with nature.
So what can you do? You can go right away to the platforms, start to learn about the ocean decade, about ocean literacy, even on our thrivability matters. Uh, you can go to learn outreach, outreach clusters. There's an ocean governance area there, or you go right away to the volunteer area and you get really into action with the knowledge you have now and do something about our world. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me.